Hello and welcome to the video. My name is Benjamin Viney and I'm a product expert here at Serif for Affinity Publisher. Now, rather excitingly, version two of the Affinity applications, photo designer and publisher has just been released. V2 is jam packed full of new and exciting features as well as updates and performance enhancements. Now, for the majority of this video, we're going to be covering what's new in Desktop Publisher, but we may segue into the other applications using our studio link. For the minute though, let's take a look at some of the new updates and features. So one of the first updates that you can probably already see is the fact that we've carried out a UI update. You'll notice on this left hand side that we have a brand new set of tools icons. We also have made changes to the layers panel. If you look to the left of the thumbnail, you can see that we now have these icons. And these icons denote what type of layer they are. If I hover over the icons, we're greeted with a tool tip. So we can see we have a few rectangles here. We've got some text frames and a picture frame just by looking at the little tool tip. We've also improved the clipping and masking areas on our layers panel. So if I take this rectangle here and I apply it to the Astro logo, we can see that the clipping and masking areas are now marked much, much more clearly. Finally, it's worth pointing out in Publisher that the font sections and resource manager have all moved from under document to now be under window and see them just here. So the first feature or tool that I want to talk to you about in this video is potentially one of my all time favorites, and that is the brand new style picker tool. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the style picker tool, it allows you to copy uh, styles, formats and attributes from existing objects and apply them or replicate them throughout your document to other entities. It's going to be really useful when initially designing your first sort of document layouts as well as at the end of your sort of document process where you might be making sure that all your formatting is consistent throughout your pages. Let's take a look how it works. So I have here this sort of card document that I've been working on and we can see on this right hand page, I have a series of circles running down its center. We see also from the layers panel that I have a set of sort of white numbering overlaying these original circles. And clearly what we want to do is copy this first circles formatting, which is this solid fill, with a sort of white outline at 1.5 points to the other circles so we can see the numbering overlaid. So we'll go ahead and we'll select our style picker tool by going to the tools panel, long clicking over the color picker tool, and then selecting the style picker tool. Now the style picker tool works on a process of loading and unloading formatting. So the moment when you first start, it should be unloaded, so the icon should look like this. But if I single click the formatting I want to copy, which obviously is going to be this circle, notice the icon changes. And this means that the icon is holding formatting or attributes. We can then single click on the circles below to apply that formatting to the other circles. Now notice that in between applications, we can still see that it's holding the first circle's original formatting. And this is really useful that I don't have to go back to the circle every time to reacquire the attributes to then distribute as I wish. So we'll apply uh, to the final circle, the first circle's attributes, so we can see our numbers one, two, three, and four. It's also worth pointing out though, this does also work with text and effects. So we can see that I have this subtitle text here, which is all caps. We can see that it is also blue and a very specific size. So I want to replicate this formatting to the other sort of subtitles on this page. But to do this, I'm going to have to unload the first circles formatting from over here. So I can do this in one of two ways. And the first way that I can do this is going to the unload button on our context toolbar, which will permanently unload the style or formatting that I have selected. Or I could hold option on Mac or alt on Windows to temporarily unload the style. So you can see that the style picker has now changed and is available for me to select a new format or attribute I want to copy. Now, if I release that option again, we can see that it maintains the existing style that we had selected. So nothing's lost in the process. I'll hold option and I'll select this first subtitle style. And then I can apply that to individual letters by click dragging to select a range of letters. I can single click individual words to apply it to individual words, or by holding command on Mac or control on Windows, I can apply it to the entire text frame. Now we can also apply styles to multiple objects at the same time. So if I go back to my move tool and then just select these three text boxes below, I can once again go to my style picker tool, holding option to unload on Mac, 
and single clicking this text frame, which uses a text style, it will automatically apply it to the other text frames that I had selected. It's just a nice way to apply it to multiple entities at the same time. Now this does work with effects. So I come down to this page here and we'll just select this circle and we'll quickly add a outer shadow. Uh, we'll change multiply to normal. We'll change the color to white as well so we can see it over this page. Uh, and actually that's not too bad as it is. So we'll just make a few minor adjustments. And what we'll do then again is we'll go back to our style picker tool, hold option to select our style again, and then apply it to the other circles on the page. So really quickly replicating the effect to the other circles on the page. This also works with multi-stroke fills and multi-stroke effects. If we come over to this document here and we move into our designer persona and locate our appearance panel, we can then use the style picker to copy the formatting of multiple strokes or fills to other shapes. So this shape here, I have selected this triangle. It uses two strokes, one set to normal and one set to erase. The normal stroke is the white stroke in the center and the black stroke, which is set to erase, is erasing this bit in the middle to give the triangle the effect of sort of floating in the center of the original shape. So we'll go ahead once again and select our style picker tool. We'll make sure that it's unloaded by holding option, selecting our new style, and then applying it to the other triangles. So that was a quick look at the style picker tool. And I think we can all agree it's going to be very, very useful in a lot of different ways. And the next tool or feature that I want to talk about is Place Auto Flow. Now, Place Auto Flow basically allows you to flow content onto automatically generated pages. Let's take a look at how it works. So you've been able to flow text uh, or overflowing text in frames onto pages since 1.9. If I simply hold shift down while clicking this triangle, it will simply flow the overflowing text onto pages, replicating the original text frame design. As we can see, this has flown the entire book onto about 50 pages or so. The wonderful Alice in Wonderland. But we've expanded this feature in 2.0. And you can now place and flow PDF content as well as image content. I've got here a series of picture frames and these picture frames are 55 millimeters by 85 millimeters, which is the standard UK business card size. So this might be a bit of an example that I'm trying to place business cards onto a page so I can then print them and cut them out. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll place our content using the place images tool. We'll find our business card example and we'll select our two designs. So this is a front and a back, as you might expect. And they'll appear in our place images panel, as they might do normally when you try and place more than one item. If I single click into one of these frames, I can place a single variation of the image as I would do normally placing an image. However, for this case, we're gonna select our entire content in our place images panel, which is just these two. And I'll choose as well to use our repeat tool. So by using our repeat tool, we'll repeat the design as many times as we set. So in this case, we're going to repeat the design 10 times into each of these waiting frames. Once I have everything selected, I simply click the first available frame. And there we go. It's automatically flowed all of those images and repeated those images into the waiting frames for me. And there we go. These are now easily prepared for printing and I can simply replicate as many front or backs as I need. We can go one step further though, we can also flow PDF content in existing documents. So here I have an architecture document that I've been working on. It's just a basic sort of bid style document. And uh, my colleague has asked me to leave eight pages in the center for him to place a PDF. So on these pages, as you can probably see on the uh, pages panel, but as well, if I toggle off the previewer, we can see that I have a series of picture frames waiting to flow this content into. So if I go ahead and place my content again, and this time I'll use the Mac shortcut, which is Command Shift M, but you could also use Control Shift M on Windows. And we'll go ahead and we'll select the PDF that we want to place. Now, once again, it will appear in our Place Images panel, and I can use this drop down to select a specific page if I wish, but instead I'm going to expand the document in the panel, and I'm going to select a series of pages. Now for this example, we're going to select from page 18 to page 25. 
So once again, I've just held shift and then single clicked to select a range of pages that I wanted to select. And then we'll move over again to our document view. And we're going to simply click again our first available picture frame. And there we go. It's automatically flown our PDF document into our waiting picture frames. It's all eight pages nicely inserted. Now notice as well that the content from the rest of the document is still available. I could repeat this process a number of times if I required or wished, but for the moment, I'm happy with the content we've placed. So I'm just going to press escape to get back to my pages panel. Finally, I'll show you a little bit more of a creative example. I've got a document here, which is meant to replicate a sort of educational document for around the world in 80 days. And you can see we start in London and I believe we end back in London, but in Greenwich as well, which is where I believe it actually ended in the book. So we've got a series of picture frames, uh, which you can see here, which are all circular. And we've got a few different effects applied as well as some group circles and drop shadows as well applied to the frames. So slightly more complicated than before. We're going to go ahead again and place our content. In this case, uh, we're placing around 50 images. And despite there being 80 days, I've only done 50 images in my file. But they do correspond with individual picture frames and have been labeled correctly. So clicking open, we'll once again have these images imported into our place images panel. And we can see day one London will correspond with day one London and day two Dover and so on and so forth will correspond with this sort of timeline. Now I could once again single click going through to each of the frames 50 times. But that is quite laborious and it's going to take quite a long time. So instead, I'll select everything in my place images panel and simply click the first available image frame. And that will automatically flow all of the images into the waiting pages. Uh, and as we can see, everything corresponds as it should. I've got a lovely image of Tokyo here in its rightful place, as well as obviously our first image of London here. It's just a bit more of a creative example, potentially how to use auto flow. So that was a quick look at the place auto flow feature. And I think you'll agree it's going to be really useful for placing PDF content into your documents. I think it's going to be really useful as well for replicating large amounts of images or text as well into waiting layouts. The next feature that we're going to look at goes sort of hand in hand with place auto flow, and that is the quick grid feature. Now, quick grid basically lets you replicate shapes, picture frames or text frames in the shape of a grid when initially drawing out that object or entity. It's going to be really useful again for creating those sort of standardized layouts really quickly and efficiently. And you'll notice that the first three tools that we've spoken about all are to do with layouts and creating and improving workflows to do with layout and document design. Let's take a look at how this one works. Now we've got here a sort of standardized document and it's sort of a bit of a farm example or a farm shop example selling these lovely organic products. We've got this layout down here, which is offering some nice tea and some classic hot chocolates. And basically we have a series of six image frames in a row, followed by a six by three grid of text frames. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and replicate this layout using the quick grid functionality. Now it's worth noting I have a series of guides here to make my life a lot easier. And I've done this by making a set of guides on a master page and replicating it into my other pages. So I'll go ahead and select my picture frame tool and begin to draw out my initial frame. And I can simply increase the number of frames I have by clicking the right or down arrows on my keyboard to replicate the image frames. Now if I press down, I'll also gain a new row, which will replicate as many columns as I currently have. But for the moment, I just want six picture frames in a single line. So I'll hold the right arrow down to increase the spacing between my frames and holding shift will increase the increments that the spacing increases in. But for the moment to get this super accurate, I'm just going to take my time and slowly increase the spacing in between the frames. Lovely. Once I'm happy with my spacing, I'll let go of the mouse button just to commit the transformation. And we'll be able to use the auto flow method we looked at earlier to flow our content into these waiting frames. But before we do that, we'll just click on properties and make sure that we're at scale to min fit. So we'll then choose to place and locate our content. We'll click open. We'll once again, select all of our content and single click the first available frame. And there we go. Our images are now nicely in our image frames. 
forming the first row of this layout. Next, we'll move on to our text frames. So we'll select our text frame tool and begin to draw out our text frame once again. And this time we'll press our right arrow key five times to create five additional frames, six in total. We'll then make another two rows by pressing the down arrow twice and then begin to increase our spacing by holding our right arrow again. Once again, we want to get this pretty accurate, so we'll take our time and slowly increase the spacing to align these frames to our images above. We'll then increase the spacing in between the frames as well, just marginally. And when I'm happy with it, I'll commit the transformation by releasing my mouse button. We can then select our bottom row of text frames and just expand them slightly to match our frames above. We can then go ahead and insert some filler text into our frames. There we go. And with our filler text inserted, I can then select my first row of frames and insert a preset text style. We can then do the same for our middle set of frames. There we go. It's beginning to look a lot more like our layout above. I'm just going to turn our capitalization off as well. There we go. So there we go. That was really a quick way using Quick Grid to replicate the layout above quickly and efficiently. So another example of using Quick Grid is replicating picture frames when drawing them out to create a photo grid or wall. So going back to my picture frame tool and just stretching out my initial frame, I can make a five by three grid really easily. I can then once again go and find my content. And these are all yummy dishes that have been made by using the farm's natural ingredients. We'll go ahead and select all of the images and then choose to place them in the first available frame. Now notice they've placed all at min fit. So if I quickly select all of my images and my frames, I can change them instead to scale to max fit. There we go. So that was a quick look at the quick grid feature. And these first sort of three features and tools that we've spoken about have all been about improving your document layout workflow. This next one is slightly more text orientated, and it's potentially one of the most requested features we've had over the last year. And that feature is the notes tool. So the new notes tool in Affinity Publisher allows you to create and manage academic style notes. There are three different types of notes you can create in Affinity Publisher, and that is EndNotes, Footnotes, and SideNotes. Each note, regardless of its type, consists of two parts. A note reference, so where your note is actually sort of positioned, and a note body for your comment or citation. So I've got an example here of a sort of newspaper layout. And what we're going to do is we're going to insert a few notes into this article about the QWERTY keyboard. So first off, we're going to reference James Densmore's contribution to the invention of the QWERTY keyboard. So I'm going to position my cursor just after the E of James Densmore's name. We'll then go up to Window, down to References, and select Notes. And this is going to bring up the Notes toolbar. We'll just expand that here so we can see all of it. I've got lots of different options here to create footnotes, side notes, and end notes. And this bar sort of changes your options below. But for this first example, we'll go ahead and we'll try and make a simple footnote. So we'll click my new note or insert note button here. And then we'll go up to my reference document. And we're going to copy my first reference. And then we'll simply paste it into our note body. So we can see after creating our note, we have a space or a text frame for our note body. And we can just about see our superscript number one here, which is the note reference. So that's the two parts we were talking about earlier. We'll go ahead and we'll select our text and we can apply a text style to this. I've already prepared one called notes. That's quite useful. And in fact, we could do it in two places. So we'll do footnotes and we'll do our number style as notes as well. There we go. We can also change our note body's positioning. So at the minute, our note positioning is set to below text. I'm going to move this to below frame. So it will then just appear at the bottom of our frame. And then for this example, I'm going to reduce the min gap before, which is the gap in between the frame and this sort of note body. 
And I'm going to turn this to zero for the moment, just so it fits on one line. I think we'll go ahead as well and then justify this to the right as well, because it looks just a bit neater. That's our first footnote in. I think we'll go ahead and we'll insert a second footnote. And this time we want this footnote to be positioned below this image, but still referencing our text body here. So instead of going to the new note button on the notes panel, I'm going to right click, go to notes and go insert footnote. Nice and simple. And we can see our text body is now prepared here. And our reference is just next to the other two represented by the superscripts two here. So we'll once again, go out to our document notes to collect our reference. And we'll come back to publisher. We'll insert the reference. And we'll once again, make sure that it is set to our footnote textile. So we're going to go ahead and increase the gap between. And we're going to want to increase this by a bit of a substantial amount. So I think we'll increase this by around 150 points and we'll see how we get on. So not quite enough. So we'll continue to increase the gap. Lovely. And we'll just make sure that this is set to our footnote style. I think we'll go ahead as well and then justify this to the right. And so there we go, very quickly and simply added in two footnotes to this article. Side notes are incredibly similar in this fact that you can add side notes into most documents. So I could simply add in a side note here. And once again, position this underneath this frame here. But instead, let's talk about endnotes. So endnotes work slightly differently from the side notes and footnotes. So they still consist of two bodies a reference and a note body. However, your note bodies for EndNotes are collected at the end of your document. So I'll come down to this page here and I'll insert a new EndNote. So notice that two things have happened. If we go back to the page that we've inserted the EndNote on, we'll see that we have a new reference. We've also had a page automatically created on the last page of our document. So we'll go ahead and expand this text box. And we'll also apply a master page to this EndNote page just to round it off a little bit. So we can then go ahead and insert our EndNote. So we want to make sure that when we're doing this, we're going to insert our new EndNote into our new note body. But specifically, as our notes are combined, we want to make sure that our notes are inserted in between our note marks. Now, if you can't see your note marks, which are these brackets here, you can always go to text down to notes and make sure that show note marks has been selected. But we'll once again go out to our reference document and we'll select our first end note that we want to insert. There we go. We'll just get rid of that extra space. Brilliant. And that's basically how to insert an end note. But we can also convert notes, which is a really, really useful feature. So if we go back to our original two footnotes that we inserted earlier, we can select a note body, right click, go to notes and go down to convert notes. This will then bring up the convert notes dialog and we can choose what notes we want to convert. So I can choose to convert my footnotes into endnotes and I can choose the scope of just the currently selected note in question or the entire document. And for the moment, we'll choose the entire document. So it will convert these two existing footnotes that we've inserted into EndNotes. When I'm happy, I'll click OK. And simply, we can see they've disappeared from this area here. Our references remain that have been updated, though, sequentially. And going to our last page, we can see our footnotes have been inserted here automatically. Now, clearly, I've added a few extra spaces at the end of these notes. We'll just tidy them up slightly. And we can once again select all of these and apply our footnote textile so everything's nice and consistent. So that was a quick look at the notes tool in Affinity Publisher. And again, I think it's going to be really useful for creating academic style notes for academic journals, business reports, or just general corporate documentation. The next feature follows along a similar workflow and again has been highly requested. And that feature is the books tool. Now the books tool allows you to combine multiple Affinity Publisher documents into one cohesive file, whilst also updating your reference information. This information might be your textiles, or it could be something like your page numbers or table of contents. Let's look at an example. So to begin with, we're going to go and find the books panel. So we'll go to windows and select books. We'll choose to create new book and we'll choose to add the documents we want to combine. Now, 
The books panel treats documents as chapters, so we'll go to the panel menu and choose add chapters. We'll then locate our files that we want to combine and we'll choose open and it will bring the files into the books panel here. Now we'll go ahead and we'll do a bit of reordering. So we'll drag our front cover to the front of our book. And it's at this point that I'd normally set my style source chapter. And you could do this simply by just clicking to the left of any chapter you want to treat as your style source. So in my case, chapter two is the style source chapter that I want to keep. It contains my master style and I want the rest of my document to adopt that as the style. So we'll leave my style source chapter as number two for the time being. We then normally go ahead and update our numbers. Now we can do this by just selecting all of our documents here, all of our chapters, going to our options menu and choosing update numbers. However, if you notice the two options I have clicked below, I have update numbers before output and update page numbers automatically selected. So this means that my page numbers and my reference numbers are going to update automatically throughout this process of combining these documents, which is really useful. Uh, next, we're going to go ahead and update our table of contents or our tables of contents within these documents. So we'll double click on our front cover and we'll locate the text frame that contains our table of contents, which is conveniently already here. Now, as you can see at the moment, it's saying there are no table of contents entries found. And that is because this is currently only looking for entries within the first document. And this first document is literally my front cover and a couple of sort of reference beginning pages. So. We'll go ahead and open our table of contents panel. With our table of contents selected, we'll change the scope from document to book. And this will now mean that the table of contents will look across the entirety of the book that we're about to create to pull entries from. And we'll just quickly click update all tables of contents. And as we can see, it's now pulling through entries. Once I'm happy with this change, I'm going to go ahead and close this document down. Now in doing so, Publisher is going to prompt me to save my document and I'm going to want to accept the changes, so I'm going to save the file. It's worth bearing in mind that this does overwrite the original file that you have just been working on. So if I now go back to this chapter one front cover, the table of contents will still be looking for the entire book for entries. It doesn't matter in this case, but it may matter working on other documents. Finally, we're going to go ahead and save our book. So this will save as an AF book file and I'm going to call this final report and we version number everything's so version 1.0 and that means if I ever want to come back and work on my book I can reopen it as a AF book file. Next we're going to export the book file. So we'll do our panel options menu and export and this will bring up our normal publisher export window. As such it gives us options to all of the normal export settings that we might want to use. Now this includes what we want to export it to. Now we're going to choose PDF, which we're already on. We're going to keep the preset for PDF print as well. And I think we're going to keep most things as they are. The advanced options give us a chance to change our color space or profile or to include bleeds or not, depending whether this is being printed or for digital use. But for the moment, I think we'll leave it there and we'll choose export. So I'm going to call this Final report v1 and we'll save it on our desktop so we can find it easily. And then publisher will automatically export that as a PDF. And we can see now that it's exported our books file as a PDF. And it's also updated all of our table of contents as well as our page numbers, combining our document into one cohesive file. Amazing. So that was a quick look at the books panel in Affinity Publisher. Again, another useful tool. The next tool we're going to look at, or the next improvement, is going to be placing DWG files. Now, this is potentially a bit more for our technical based audience, but hopefully could still be useful. We've moved into a bit more of a technical architecture themed document, and what we want to do is place a DWG of this site plan for this architecture build. So we'll go ahead and place our content as we normally would do. So we'll do Command Shift M on Mac or Control Shift M on Windows. We'll select our DWG that we want to place and we'll choose open. And we're greeted with an import options dialog and we can choose what page we want to import, the DPI or using the host DPI, which I'll keep for the minute to keep scale. And the only other thing that I'm really interested in is potentially the remove hidden items. So we'll keep that on as well. Once I'm happy, I'll click OK. 
and then I can place the DWG in the waiting picture frame down here. Now we'll just change our properties to scale to min fit as well. And there we go, we've placed in our DWG. We'll zoom in slightly to get a better look and we'll just increase the scale slightly and move the image down to better fill the space. So our DWG is in, however, we can't edit it yet. And that's because we've imported this as a linked resource. We need to make sure that the resource is embedded. So we're going to go to our resource manager, which if you remember, has moved from under document to under windows. And we're going to change this DWG, which is currently a linked resource to embedded. Now, if I double click on the image itself, it will open the DWG in a separate document window and I can make some changes to the file. In this case, I'm just going to remove some of the annotated text so we can clearly see some of the lines underneath. Once I'm happy with my changes, I'll close the embedded document view. And we can see that the changes have pulled through into the file. So that was a quick look at placing and editing DWG files. Um, quite a technical workflow, but hopefully quite useful in certain scenarios. The next thing I want to talk about is linked layer visibility overrides. Now, it sounds quite complicated, but basically, if you place a PDF or a designer document that contains layer information, providing it's linked, you can then toggle that layer information on or off. Now, one of the key aspects of this is that the resources that you've placed in your document need to be linked. So to check this, we'll select this resource here, so this site plan. We'll go up to our resource manager, which remember has moved from under document, and we'll double check that these resources have been linked. Yeah, we could see here they've all been linked. So this means if I double click onto the actual document itself through the picture frame, we have several options up here on the context toolbar. If I come to layers and interact with the drop down, I can then turn separate layers on or off. So for instance, we can remove the trees and the grass to give you an idea of sort of the scale of just the buildings and the asphalt and the concrete. Alternatively, we could go the other way around and we could remove some of the outer buildings. Uh, we could turn off the roads and some of the grids and sandstone to give you a bit of an idea of some of the outer landscape area. Alternatively, we could hide all and show all, toggling layers on and off at will. But I think we'll make some edits to these smaller examples over here. So I'll double click in and for this example, I'll choose first to hide all and then I'll select just the trees, grass outlines, grass, show the surrounding area that the buildings will impact. For this example, we'll do the reverse. So we will turn off the trees, turn off the grass and river to give you an overview of the buildings in the area. So there we go. That was a quick look at linked layer visibility override, the ability to be able to toggle layers on and off in PDFs and designer documents that you've placed within Publisher. Again, hopefully another useful feature. For the time being, that is the last of our major features, but we do have some other minor improvements that I want to talk about. One of the first features that we've implemented is being able to paste linked URL resources. So if I go to this web browser here, and click drag the file into Publisher. If I then hold control when importing into my document, the file will place as a linked resource. Now I can edit this as I normally would, but if I check my resource manager, we'll see now that it's come through as linked remote. Another small change we've made is that you can now convert frame text to artistic text and vice versa. So we've got some frame text that we've selected here that probably should be artistic text because we might want to move it around a little bit later on and make some small changes. So if I go up to layer, we can come down to convert to art text. So we can also change this back by converting to text frame. This might make things a little bit easier later on when trying to move things around that are potentially meant to be more like artistic text. Another change that we've made to Publisher, or an improvement I should say, is you now have access to Select Same from within Publisher itself. So we've always had access to the Select Same function from the designer persona, but now if I select this circle and I go to Select and Select Same, I can choose Fill Color and I can make adjustments to the circles at the same time. 
I'll make them a bit of a bright pink. Finally, you may have spotted it in the bottom left hand corner that we've added in a word counter. And if you want to toggle the word counter view on and off, you can go to view and toggle show word counter. And this works rather well. So I've got some filler text here. And if I double click and choose expand field, we can see that we have 293 words in this section here. Last but not least, we have added in a feature that allows you to save over an existing package file. So you can now go save as package, go through our normal document warnings, find the original package file and resave it, updating the original file. Publisher will present you with a warning dialog before you commit to this, explaining that you may overwrite files or files may be deleted as a result of you resaving over the existing package. For the minute, I'll click yes and we'll resave over the existing package. That was a quick look at some of the new and exciting features that V2 Publisher has to offer. I hope you found them as interesting and as exciting as I have, and I hope you enjoy getting to grips with the new features and tools over the coming weeks. Be sure to check out our new V2 YouTube tutorials. We'll be uploading to the channel regularly for the foreseeable future. But for the moment, I've been Benjamin Viney, and you've been watching the What's New in V2 Publisher Edition. Thank you for watching.